Hey there, this is Professor Nathanson. Let's talk aggregation. Okay, now keep in mind, like I like to say in class, for SMJ, you want to measure subject matter jurisdiction party by party, claim by claim. Okay, so you have a basic scenario. Say you have Florida and Pennsylvania sue uh, Texas, and these are individual defendants. Okay, these are people, and it's a car wreck, three cars. Florida seeks $80,000, and Pennsylvania seeks $100,000, okay? Let's assume these amounts are pleaded in good faith, and then in each case, the plaintiff can get over the jurisdictional amount. Well, this is very clear, straightforward example. There's going to be subject matter jurisdiction. But we still got to measure it party by party, claim by claim, all right? Florida versus Texas, parties are diverse. The controversy exceeds 75K. Same with the second claim. Parties are diverse. Mountain controversy is met. So we're good here. However, there are scenarios where you might or you might not be able to add amounts together to meet the amount in controversy. So let's play around with some more hypos. So let's imagine our Florida plaintiff our Florida plaintiff sues our Texas defendant in federal court. Count one is for battery and seeks $50,000. Count two is for an unrelated contract breach seeking $50,000. Okay, is the amount in controversy met? And here the answer is yes. Why? because of our friend aggregation. Any one plaintiff, any one claimant, can add together all of the separate claims they have against any one individual opposing party, and if those amounts together exceed the amount in controversy, then the amount in controversy is met. Now, let's add these together, 50K plus 50K, Okay, we're not math majors here, but that sounds like $100,000 to me. Well, that meets the amount in controversy, okay? And as long as the St. Paul Mercury test is satisfied, then that $100,000 is good because it's over 75 k all right? Now, remember, St. Paul Mercury test, we ask, did the plaintiff plead over the amount in controversy in good faith? And if so... Um, do we nevertheless know that it's uh, legally certain the plaintiff can't exceed the amount in controversy? Okay, now we don't have all the facts here regarding the battery, the contract, so let's just posit that the 50K and the 50K are both good and uh, the, the amount of controversy is met here because the amount of controversy is actually uh, $100,000, which exceeds 75. This is a very basic example of aggregation all right now aggregation is actually quite limited in its applicability now let's illustrate this with a couple more hypotheticals hypothetical number one imagine that a citizen of Florida sues citizens of Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania so I have two defendants both from Pennsylvania okay both citizens of Pennsylvania the plaintiff sues defendant number one uh, seeking $50,000 for uh, uh, hitting his car, okay, and sues uh, citizen two, defendant two, um, for uh, injuries to uh, his person, okay? So imagine a, 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 an accident, uh, one accident, and the plaintiff sues two defendants, one seeking $50,000 for what happened to his car, and the other seeking $50,000 for his personal body injuries, all right? Is subject matter jurisdiction going to be satisfied? What do you think? The answer is going to be no. Why? Because under aggregation, any one claimant, here that's the plaintiff, can aggregate together all claims she or he has against any one opposing defending party. Well, here... The $50,000 uh, amounts in controversy are sought against two different defendants. Aggregation is not going to be permitted, okay? 
what about question hypo number two? Okay, and imagine again, one claimant is seeking recovery for what happened to the car, and the others seeking what happened uh, uh, to their to their body, to their person. Okay, personal injuries. Okay, so here you have plaintiff one suing the defendant from Pennsylvania, seeking fifty thousand dollars for the car, and plaintiff two seeking $50,000 for the personal injuries to the body okay, against the same defendant. Is there going to be aggregation? What do you think? Is the answer yes? Yes? Nope. It's no. No aggregation. Sorry, uh -uh, ain't going to happen. Why? Because the amount and controversies are separate. These are separate claims. Okay? Now there are twists to this. There are twists to this. Uh, normally it's said that you can't have any aggregation uh, with, with separate claimants. Well, this one's a little bit more difficult. You'll want to think about this a little bit. But imagine if you have uh, uh, two plaintiffs that are both uh, joint beneficiaries of a trust. Okay, So beneficiary one and beneficiary two and the amount of the trust, the total value of the trust is eighty thousand dollars. Eighty thousand dollars. Well, didn't write that real well, right? Let's try that again. Eighty thousand dollars. There we go. And they sue the trustee, citizen of Pennsylvania. All right. Is the amount of controversy met? This is not even an aggregation uh, hypo at all. So if, if you think aggregation is okay, well, the answer is really no, because it's not aggregation. This is an example of a joint and undivided interest, okay? This is not something we're going to get into further in Civ Pro this year. This is really something that's more likely to show up in, in your uh, property class, might show up in your torts class, maybe. Um, you take wills and trust. That may show up there as well okay so just know that that when you have something that that's like a a, a a joint and undivided interest okay well then um you treat it as one interest that that's jointly held okay now here's another twist suppose there is a car that goes bad and the plaintiff is injured so say the plaintiff is a citizen of Florida, that's the driver, and the defendant is a, 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 a car manufacturer who's uh, incorporated in Delaware with its headquarters, in other words, it's PPOB in uh, California, all right? And here's what the plaintiff sues for. Three separate counts okay count one seeks fifty thousand dollars and says that there was a breach of warranty okay there's a defect in the car that breached the warranties uh, uh, that came with the car all right count two is for you guessed it fifty thousand dollars for negligent design defendant negligently designed component in the car as a result causing the damages claimed for. Count three is $50,000 for a uh, strict liability, for product liability. All right, is the amount in controversy met? What do you think? Well, on the one hand, let's do our math here, 50 plus 50 plus 50 equals, ready for it, in these facts it equals 50. Did I lose my mind? No. Is the amount of controversy met? No. What am I getting at? In this scenario, the three counts, $50,000 each for breach of warranty, for negligent design, and for strict liability, are just three different legal theories, all of which are aimed at describing the same claim. Three theories, all for the same injury, 
Now these are different ways of expressing the same claim. Let's think about it. Plaintiff is suing the defendant because something went wrong with the plaintiff's car, causing $50,000 in harm. The plaintiff is trying a breach of warranty theory, trying a negligence theory, and trying a strict liability theory, any one of which may lead to victory. However, let's imagine what would happen at trial, okay? Assuming that all the damages the plaintiff is entitled to is $50,000, then that's the most the plaintiff can get, right? So the amount in controversy here is not $150,000. The amount in controversy here is $50,000. And that's why I say, defining the laws of mathematics, and here I'm saying 50 plus 50 plus 50 under these facts equal 50. Now I have one final uh, uh, scenario for you. Um, imagine you have uh, 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 two plaintiffs and one defendant. So you have a, a plaintiff from Pennsylvania and a second pe plaintiff from Pennsylvania. And you have the defendant uh, as a citizen of California. Okay. And let's say the California defendant was doing some construction work that caused injuries to both plaintiff one and, oops, that should be plaintiff two, okay? Plaintiff one asserts a negligence claim seeking $100,000, okay? Plaintiff two asserts a negligence claim arising from the same circumstances, also seeking money, but only seeking $10,000. Well, what do you think about this one, guys? Well, let's go back to the beginning. You've got to go party by party, claim by claim. All right. How about PA1 versus California? Is there SMJ? The answer is yes, right? Parties are diverse. Now, controversy looks good. How about number two? Parties are diverse again, but the amount in controversy is too low. Okay. Well, what about aggregation. Is aggregation possible? What do you think? Some of you might be thinking right now that aggregation is possible and I'm going to tell you in, in, in absolutely clear tone, clear terms, the answer here is no. Absolutely not. Aggregation is not possible. Why? Because aggregation will be for one party against one separate party. Here, you're talking about aggregating between two separate um, claimants. Aggregation here between PA1 and PA2 is not possible. Okay? Second question. Is there subject matter jurisdiction? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. Why? And the answer is supplemental jurisdiction. Now, supplemental jurisdiction is something that is beyond our current discussion, but is something that you need to be aware of. Okay, supplemental jurisdiction that is something that exists only when there's already original jurisdiction. If there's original jurisdiction, then you may be able to have supplemental jurisdiction. Now here, okay, I just want to peek at this language right here. Okay, here's a supplemental jurisdiction statute. Okay, for there to be supplemental jurisdiction, the first thing you need is original jurisdiction. Well, examples of original jurisdiction include 1332 diversity, includes 1331 federal question, also includes 1338 patents, copyrights, and, and, and uh, federal trademark law. Okay, those are all examples of original jurisdiction. When you look at these statutes, 1332, 1331, and so on, the statutes say these are examples of original jurisdiction. All right, well, if you have original jurisdiction, then the courts will have supplemental jurisdiction over claims with a sufficient um, relationship between the claims with original jurisdiction 
and the claims with supplemental jurisdiction. Put differently, to have OJ, excuse me, to have supplemental jurisdiction must have original jurisdiction first. Okay, and there must be a sufficient relationship between the original claim and the supplemental claim. And supplemental claims can involve the joinder of additional parties as well. Now, let's go back to our hypo. All right, in our hypo, do we have original jurisdiction? Yes, we do. Do we have supplemental jurisdiction? It would appear that the answer here is yes, because first we have the original jurisdiction, we have the OJ. Regarding the supplemental claim, which would be the claim of PA2 versus Cal, is there a relationship between the original claim and the, the, the supplemental claim? And here the answer um, is yes. I said uh, the California defendant did uh, something that caused the injury to both PA1 and PA2. Imagine, for example, it, 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 it's a car crash, okay? Same incident leading to injuries in two plaintiffs, okay? That seems pretty darn related, doesn't it? So you have original jurisdiction, you have a claim that is extremely related to claim over which there's original jurisdiction. That would appear, appear to be a basis for supplemental jurisdiction. Now, I want to, to say uh, two things in, um, in closing on this. Um, um, the first is the ice cream, uh, 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 the ice cream metaphor. All right, it's like this. Imagine a quart is an ice cream cone, okay? Is, is the cone itself make an ice cream cone? No, it's just a cone, right? If you want an ice cream cone, you also need ice cream, all right? Well, if the cone is the quart, then original jurisdiction, such as that under section 1332, is the ice cream. If and only if you have an original jurisdiction in the federal court, well, you have a civil action. You need the cone, and you need the ice cream. Well, supplemental jurisdiction would be the sprinkles, all right? Because there's no such thing as an ice cream cone that would be just the cone and the sprinkles. First, you need the court, the cone, you need the OJ, the ice cream, and then and only then can you add the sprinkles. That's the metaphor behind um, supplemental jurisdiction. So that's the first thing that I want us to think about in closing. Here's the second. Let's not get too far ahead of ourselves with supplemental jurisdiction. There's some additional twists and turns with supplemental jurisdiction um, that make it a significantly more uh, complex than I'm saying right now. Um, but the basic idea I want us to think about in this particular closing hypothetical um, is, is, like I've said above, Is aggregation possible in this scenario? No. Why? Because PA1 and PA2 are separate plaintiffs. Is there supplemental jurisdiction, or rather is there subject matter jurisdiction? The answer is yes. Why? Not because of aggregation, but rather because of supplemental jurisdiction. So anyway, um, I hope this video has been helpful to you, and I look forward to uh, uh, preparing the next video for you. Um, bye.